Hey there! Whether you're a part of our church family or you're a friend tuning in, we love that you're here and we pray that today you might hear from God. This message is a part of our series where we're working our way through the Gospel of John. And throughout John's Gospel, we see Jesus for who He truly is. He's the promised Messiah, the Son of God, and He's the Savior of the world. You know, it's our joy to be able to provide access to teaching, worship, and other resources to equip and train the Church of Jesus. And while we are encouraged for you to benefit from them, we do ask that these would only be supplemental and in no way replace a commitment to gathering and learning within a local church body. These resources are gifts of God's grace for people to grow with, but they're never meant to replace a belonging to a covenant community of faith. If you'd like to learn more about Center Grove Church and what we're up to, head over to cglife.org and you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Center Grove. And if you'd like to reach out, you can simply email us at info at cglife.org. Now, we pray that God stirs in your heart as you listen to the proclamation of His Word. Amen. I love to hear all those voices. I love to hear all those voices. Let's take our Bibles and turn to John. Chapter 14, we're making our way through what uh, scholars call Jesus' farewell discourse as we make our way through the gospel of John. We're in John 14, and we're moving rather slowly through the opening portions of John 14. We're uh, sitting and we're soaking in John 14, if you will. As you sit and soak in John 14, you take in more of its truth, and so that's what we're doing. John chapter 14 And uh, we'll be looking especially this morning at verses 4, 5, and 6. But let's start in verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may also be. And you know the way. You know the way to where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, Father of lights, we uh, bless you because in you there is light and no shadow of turning. You are the giver of every good and perfect gift. And Father, one of your greatest gifts to us is the gift of your word. And we're so grateful for it, so thankful for it. Your word functions in our lives as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, your, your word is to us um, a solid foundation, a solid guide. Your son told us that heaven and earth will pass away, but, but your word remains, your word stands. We're grateful, Father, that the unfolding of your words gives light. We're thankful, Lord, that in such a life as ours, uh, though we are sojourners here, travelers here, We're not without help. We're not without guidance. We're not without direction because you've given to us your word. Help us to hear this morning your word as we read it and as we hear it granted to us by uh, this record of your son's teaching about himself. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we live in an age of what I would call contradiction. We are um, the most connected people who have ever lived. And yet at the same time, because of technology, and yet at the same time, we are also the most isolated and the most alienated people who have ever lived. And as a result of that, we are incredibly lonely, Uh, very Lonely. In fact, some are calling our loneliness a public health crisis. 
Now, loneliness is serious because it creates things like disrupted sleep and depression and anxiety and worsened cardiovascular health and worsened dementia and premature death. It is nothing to laugh at. I, I did a little survey in our last um, in our last starting point, and I just said to people, what are you looking for from a church? It just helps. It's, it's, it's good to know what people are, uh, are longing for. And, and we like to say at Center Grove, we, we don't really care what you want, but we really do care what you need. If we, we care about what you need, not, not necessarily what you want, because you can want anything, but if you've got a need, we, we, we're, we'll try to meet that need. So it's, what are you looking for in a church? It was absolutely fascinating. Person after person after person after person said, community, connection, community, connection, community, connection. Why? Because we are so lonely. We are so disconnected. We are so alienated. Understanding that actually helps us where we are in the 21st century, particularly in the 21st century West. Understanding that helps us understand why we need people. I think one of the things we're learning in our culture is that while we might not always like other people, we always need other people. And the way we're doing life and the way we're experiencing life without others isn't working well for us. It may feel safer. We might feel like we've got more of life under control, but the lives we wind up living aren't healthy lives. They aren't life-giving, and it isn't, at the end of the day, really living. And so while uh, loneliness and isolation and alienation are big issues for us, the truth is they've always been human problems. But I want you to pause with me and think just for a minute. What if you met the perfect person? And what if you, you found the perfect person and you found that perfect person to be a close friend and a supporter and a helper and an encourager? And imagine you found someone who ended your loneliness, who ended your isolation, who ended your alienation and did it just right. If you can imagine that just for a moment, then what I want to say to you is you then understand what it was that the disciples found when they found Jesus. And you begin to understand why, why they are so very troubled by Jesus' announcement in John 13, where he says, little children, yet a little while, I'm with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I'm going to say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. You better understand why they went into a panic. And you better understand why Jesus finally responds to them, not simply by commanding them to stop being troubled and, and inviting them to trust his father and to trust himself. And, and why he responds by telling them that he will come again to take them to his father's house and why he assures them that they already, look at verse four, know the way to where he's going. It is because of what they thought they were losing that they really weren't losing. It was the answer to their isolation, their alienation, their separation. Now, what's interesting to me is after Jesus says that in verse four, the disciples aren't so sure. And I love Thomas. He speaks for everyone in verse five and he says, Lord, I've got to be honest with you. We don't know where you're going. You say you're going to the Father's house, and we don't know where you're going. And because we don't know exactly where you're going, how can we know the way? And this is where Jesus says famously, and I will say controversially, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, Thomas's declaration in question give Jesus the opportunity to do a couple of things here, to explain who he is and to explain what that means for everyone. Jesus explains everything that humans need to know about the right way to life and living. He shows us the way to life 
And living is not a matter of what, but it is a matter of who. It is not a matter of what we do, but it is a matter of who we know. I am, Jesus says famously, the way. And not only that, I am the truth. And not only that, I am the life. And this means no one comes to the Father except through me. And so here we have in compressed form a grand description of the one who is the ultimate subject matter of all the Bible, Jesus. And we have four of the most extraordinary claims anyone has ever made about themselves. It is really shocking. You probably are used to hearing this, but to have heard it for the first time would have been shocking. And I will say to your pagan friends, to those who did not grow up with a Christian background, this is still shocking. It is still offensive. In fact, it is probably more shocking and more offensive in the United States today than it has been for 100 years. I love the way C.S. Lewis dealt with this issue of Jesus' massive claims. I am, I am, I am, and no one. I am, I am, I am, and no one can come to the Father but by me. C.S. Lewis in his Mere Christianity writes, he says, I, I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm writing to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, about Christ. I, I'm ready to accept him as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Lewis says, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be a lunatic. On the level with a man who says he's a poached egg. Or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He hasn't left that open to us. He did not intend to leave that open to us. He said very frankly, very plainly, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one makes it to the Father except through me. Either he was speaking the truth or he's crazy. And you've got to choose. There is no middle ground. Now, given what Jesus claims here, it's vital to understand what he says about himself. As Lewis says, we all must make our choice as to what we will do with Jesus as he presents himself to us. We don't have the luxury of treating him as we want or imagining him to be, of coming to him as we want him to be. Many of you might say, well, this sermon then isn't for me because I've already chosen to accept Jesus' claim to be God and Lord of all and Savior of sinners. And I would say to you, very good. I'm glad to hear that. But... The heart of faithful, enduring Christian living, the kind that we've been talking about over the past several weeks, the kind that uh, deserves a well done at the end of it, is a life lived continually, watch this, continually choosing to choose and know Jesus as he is and as he presents himself, not as we somehow would like for him to be. It's an interesting thing to me that if you look at the Bible, the prayers of the Bible are, are, very few of the prayers of the Bible are for comfort. There are some prayers in the Bible for help. But, but if you look at it, a great number of the prayers of the Bible are actually prayers that cry out and say, Lord, I want to know you. I need to know you. It's not so much give me comfort, give me help, give me peace. It's give me you. 
I want to know you. Why, why is that? It is because you cannot make sense out of life without the true God factored in to life. And part of the secret of, of, of living the faithful Christian life is learning to choose the Jesus of the New Testament again and again and again and again. It is coming to know him better and better and better and better so that in everything who he is informs how you live. If we're not careful, we can remake him rather than receiving him. If we're not careful, we can remake him rather than receiving him. This is a constant choice, and especially for believers. And believers must ask and keep asking, do I believe he is who he says he is? So exactly then, what does it mean? What is Jesus telling us when he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me? I want to say to you this morning that um, he's telling us three things about himself that, I, uh, that, that, that have to be believed and believed Again and again and again. He's saying first, I am the only effective means to life. He's saying secondly, I am the only real measure of life. And he's saying thirdly, I am the only true source of life. I'm the only effective means. I'm the only real measure. I'm the only true source. If you want to know me, you've got to know and understand these three things. Let's look at each of them. First, Jesus affirms, I am the way. And you'll notice that everything leading up to this statement in, in uh, 14.6 has to do with finding and knowing where Jesus is going and the way to where he is. Verse uh, chapter 13, verse 36, where are you going? 13, 36, where I'm going, you cannot come. But 14, 4, you know the way. 14, 5, we don't know. How can we know the way? This is a critical term in this passage. Thomas wants a map. He wants a how-to guide for the way and, and for being where Jesus is. He wants a map to the Father's house. And Jesus defines both by pointing to himself. He doesn't give Thomas a definite place or a specific set of directions. He describes his own person as a way for sinners to his holy father, his perfect home, and thus to salvation and eternal life. And so Jesus is saying the only effective means to finding and receiving the life that is truly life is me. And this is quite a claim. Jesus is saying that everything else that claims to bring or offer life is a lie, is a sham. He's asserting that he alone can make the impossible new life and impossible new me and new you possible. He's the means by, by a living participation in a genuine relationship with the living God. He's the way by which they're opened up. I had the most extraordinary experience at the dry cleaners this past week. Can I tell you about it? Sure, I thought so. Um, I have been praying for a gentleman uh, at, at my dry cleaners for a long time, his whole family. Been praying for them because my sense was um, they uh, knew about Jesus, didn't know him. And uh, this, this gentleman is a fine gentleman. I, I really like him. I, I struck up conversations with him, but... Uh, he kept buying dry cleaners, and so he was less and less at the one that I go to. And uh, lo and behold, I was late picking up some laundry, and I wandered in there, and there he was. And, and I, immediately when I stepped into the store, he was different. It was like, I wanted to go, You've been working out <laughs> on a new diet? You've been eating nuts and twigs and berries? Because, man, you're looking really healthy. I walked in and 
And he saw me and his face just lit up and he said, can I give you a hug? I thought, well, I'm really here for my dry cleaning. I'm not really here for hugs, but okay. So he hugged me and he began to tell the story. Can you guess what his story was? He found the way, he found the truth, and he found the life. And I was suddenly confronted with this extraordinary reality that I know in my heart that I've experienced myself, but this extraordinary reality that Jesus is still changing lives. He could not stop talking about Jesus. He says, I, he said, I can't stop reading the Bible. He said, I, I can't put it down. And he said, the more I read, the more I want to read. And he said, you know how I was. And I, yeah. <laughs> but he said, my life has changed. I've been set free. And I said, man, I can see it in your face. You used to be so contorted and so, I guess dry cleaning is a tough business. I don't know. But I'll tell you what, dry cleaning without Jesus and dry cleaning with Jesus, there's all the world of difference. And that goes with medicine and being an MD and RN. It goes with being a, a contractor, a landscaper. It's all different when you factor in Jesus. I am the way, do you, do you see, do you see, do you see, do you see? He had found what Jesus meant when Jesus said, I am the door. Everyone who passes through me finds life. He found the door. He's found the door. I was so encouraged by that. We, we, we must never forget that Jesus is the door by which people enter this new life with God and are saved. And that the way he accomplishes this uh, life for us who are living dead in our trespasses and sins is through his cross and his resurrection and his ascension as we've been talking about. Jesus is the only access point to the Father. He's the only guarantee of life in this world. And this is good news, even though it's hard news for some people to hear. No one can, and, and no one is ever asked to find by their own resources and strength their way to God or their way to truth or their way to life. Not one of us has those resources or the strength to undo what we've done and to be where he is with his father. But Jesus did have the strength. Jesus does have the strength. We can't just barge in, but Jesus gets us in. He's the way. I remember back in uh, the great, great days, I think we're in 1994 to 1997, when a, when a fellow by the name of Tim Duncan was playing for my demon deacons, and we were amazing. Do you remember those days? Some of you weren't even born then. There was a day when we were amazing. And it was all because of Tim Duncan. There was no other way to explain it. Um, we were amazing. Ron Wellman was the athletic director and he was a friend of our family and he invited us to go to a game. And then he invited us to go and meet Tim Duncan down in the locker room. And I'm telling you, I felt like I was somebody. We walked past all the security. They, they didn't say a word to us because Ron Wellman was leading the way. We, there we walked past all the security down this tunnel, and he led us right up to Tim Duncan, who was so tall. I didn't realize how tall they were till, oh my, are they tall. And we got to meet him. Why? Because we pushed our way in? No, 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 no. Ron Wellman got us in. We got real access to the real person. It's Jesus who gets us in. He's the insider who gives us real access 
to his father. There is no other. He got me in. He's the way. Jesus says, I am the way you find God. And we can celebrate that, and and we should if we are believers, but we also need to remember that because Jesus is the way, a lost world needs to know about Jesus. That is heavy at the end of the verse. There, no one comes to the Father except through me. Next, Jesus says, I am the truth. If Jesus is the way to life and, and the Father, uh, if he's the way, how is he also the truth? He's the truth in the sense that he's the one through whom people not only find God, but know him as he is and understand what life here and hereafter actually mean. And we can say that Jesus is the truth about life and the God of life. Jesus is the truth about life because Jesus is the truth about God. And it, this, is, this is so vital. He perfectly displays who God is. He perfectly displays what God is like. His character, his words, his deeds are the character and words and deeds of God. He says in John 5, 19 and 8, 29 that he only says what the Father tells him to speak and he only does what the Father tells him to do. So he is the ultimate and the perfect expression of God. He's the final and perfect expression of God's heart. That cannot I cannot underscore this enough. Why this matters so much that Jesus says, I am the truth. Have you ever tried to be somebody's friend and it didn't work out so well? Have you ever tried to be somebody's friend and it didn't work out so well? Yeah. There's something important here that we need to see. It helps us understand what Jesus is saying. You know, if if we're going to have a friendship, what's got to happen? I know President Biden. I know about him. I have information about him, but I can't say that I know him. Right? Uh, There's an informational knowledge that I have, but I don't have a personal knowledge. To really have a friendship, there's got to be a there's got to be some information to be sure. I, I can't have a real relationship with you if I don't have information about you. I mean, like, where are you from? What kind of food do you like? You know, what do you do in your spare time? What ticks you off? That so I don't do that. And what makes you happy? So I maybe do that and those kind of things. If you're going to have a friendship, you've got to have some information. But you've also got to have permission. To, 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 to connect with that person's heart. What do they love? What do they long for? What makes them tick rather than what ticks you off, right? What makes you tick? And, and that requires an openness. I can't say to you, I'm gonna be your friend. Meet me at Starbucks 3 p.m. on Wednesday. That probably is not gonna be the beginning of a, of a friendship, But there's got to be an openness on both sides. There's got to be a willingness to to open up your heart and to share your heart and say, this hurts and this helps and this was my greatest moment. And as you really get to know each other better, this is my worst moment. That's how deep relationships are made. Here's what I want you to see. When Jesus says, I am the truth, he's saying, I'm the truth about life, yes, but ultimately he's saying, I'm the truth about God. And in Jesus' coming, God opened up his heart to us. And he said to to us, this is, if you want to know who I am and what I'm like, look at my son. If you want to know what makes me weep, look at him weep. If you want to know what brings me joy, look at what brings him joy. Jesus is how God the Father opened himself up to us and showed us his heart. It's 
So Jesus is the way he's chosen for humanity to find and know him. And this really is the essence of Christianity. God wants to be known personally. God comes to be known personally in Jesus. And it means that anyone can have both true informational knowledge of God and personal knowledge of God. And when you have both, everything else you have or know pales in comparison. This is what my, my dry cleaning friend, this is his problem. He's got information about Jesus now. He always had some of that, but now he's got personal knowledge of Jesus and he cannot get enough. Nothing else matters to him like this matters to him. Everything else comes in a distant second. Jesus came to make sure that we had the best of information and personal experience when it comes to knowing the God of the universe. And so Colossians 1 says, he is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1 says, uh, long ago and at times, and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus, is the message of the New Testament. There's no reason to wonder. Jesus is the sum of all God has done. He's the sum of all God is doing. He's the sum of all God will do. He's the truth about God. He is the truth about life. And as the truth about life, Jesus then becomes, for believers, the lens through which we're meant to understand and view and measure human history, other people, and the world around us. It's by his light, by who he is, that we know what is good and, and what is moral darkness and evil. He's the standard for measuring what is real and what matters here in life. We are not the standard. He's the standard of what matters. And so he becomes then the truth we live by. And this is so important for me to say. Every idea offered to us in our culture as truth has to be made to submit to what Christ has said and what Christ has done. Now, I'm not going to veer too far here, but I am going to say this. In the beginning, God created a uh, uh, man, right? Man and woman, he created them. We as followers of Jesus must determine issues of gender based upon what God's word has said and what God's son has done. He is our measure, not our culture's definitions or redefinitions. He is our measure. And all of our lives have to be looked at that way. We've got to understand our marriages and our children through the lens of what God has said to us in his word and through his son, Jesus Christ. Every political notion, every concept that somebody else tells us is appropriate, right, good, or true has to be placed under Christ, has to be placed under what he has taught. I'm going to cover all the bases. I'll start with the easy stuff and I'll go to the harder stuff. You may be a member of the Green Party. You may be a member of the Libertarian Party. You may be a member of the Democratic Party. You may be a member of the Republican Party. But I want to say to you, I don't care what party you're a member of. You are a Jesus first person. And you have to measure your political views 
by the truth as it is in Jesus. Stop letting other people decide what is truth for you. You already know him. Measure everything else by him. Okay? Okay. Was this a fun sermon or what? It is simply this. Jesus says, I must be the truth you live by. What I teach and what I say must have priority over every other truth in your life. Now, I know that making applications of that to real world situations can sometimes be a challenge, but God has given us minds to think. But I will tell you, loved ones, Followers of Jesus must, when Jesus speaks, we've got to bow. And we must not bow at any other altar. We must not bow to elephants or donkeys. You can quote me on that one. Finally, Jesus announces, I am life. And Jesus, since Jesus is the way to the Father and the truth about the Father by the Father's design, he's also rightly called the life from the Father. Indeed, by the Father's plan, Jesus is the only source of life. And as we've seen, Jesus is said elsewhere to be the creator of life. He's the sustainer of life. I mean, every breath we've taken in this room has come from him. And then ultimately, and we love this about him, he's the restorer of life. The life we lost in the garden, he's restored at the cross. I don't know who you are, but I've noticed somebody in our church drives a pickup truck. Now, I know several of you do, but I've noticed one pickup truck in particular, and uh, it's got a, uh, a plate on the front where the license plate is supposed to go. And I don't know who's trying, I've been looking for the owner, so maybe it's you and you can identify yourself to me after, after the service, but... Somebody in this church has got a pickup truck, and on the front of the truck, on the, on the plate, it, this is what it says. Jesus is life. The rest is just hunting and fishing. <laughs> I thought to myself, that's John 14, 6. It's just contextualized in Davie County or... Yakin County or something, but it's John 14, 6. It's the Davie County paraphrase. It's the Yakin County paraphrase. Jesus is life. Everything else is just hunting and fishing. But what this means is that if you're a Christian, Jesus is the reason you live. See, here, here's where we've stopped listening to, to Jesus and we've stopped listening to what he's told us about himself and we've start, started remaking him and what we want him to be. We want Jesus to be the help for our marriage. We want Jesus to be the help for our career. We want Jesus to be the help for our banks, bank accounts. We want Jesus to be the help for our wealth building endeavors. Jesus never said he was any of those things. He simply said, I am life. I am life. And what does that mean? It means this. He, 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 he's not just a help for your life. He is your life. He's not just a help for your marriage and your family. He's the reason for your marriage and your family. He's not just a help in your sports endeavors. He's not just a help for your schooling. He's not just a help with your career. He's not just a help with your hunting and your fishing. He should be the reason behind everything that you do. And if Jesus can't get behind whatever it is you're doing, you should stop doing whatever it is. 
But when I get up, you say, well, you're a pastor. And I'm going to go, yep, this is a terrible illustration. I just realized it. I was going to say, when I get up and go to work, I go to work for Jesus. And you're going, well, yeah. <laughs> I hate when that happens when I'm preaching. <laughs> well, yeah. Duh. You're in IT, right? Right? Am, am I right? Kind of. What does he do? He's an engineer. Oh, sorry. Engineers to have everything straight. He is an engineer. <laughs> but here's the reality. When he gets up to go do his engineering, Jesus is the reason. Am I right? Yeah. He's the reason we get up in the morning He's a reason we press through when we're suffering. He's the reason we stand firm when the storms come. Jesus is the reason. Jesus is life. The rest, just engineering and fishing. I must be, Jesus says, the reason you live. I know all of these claims are disturbing to many and they probably stir up more hatred than any of his other claims because they challenge the notion in the end that we are God, that we can save ourselves. They challenge the notion that all of the religions of the world are somehow equal and get us to the same place. They challenge the notion that if we work hard enough through some religious system, God will finally accept us. And anyone who agrees with these claims, who sings the song we sang earlier, who says, I believe he's the way, the truth, and the life, will always face fierce opposition and hatred if they live as if that's true. Because if you live as if that's true, then you will find that you cannot help but tell others about him who is the way, the truth, So there will be those who will call you intolerant, ignorant, and narrow. But I want to remind you there are some dry cleaners out there. Who are waiting to hear those same words that others so challenge and disparage. And when they hear that Jesus is the way to God, the truth about God, and the life from God, they will find hope and healing. They'll come to know what it is to be made whole and alive, to have life. And rather than hearing a harsh claim, when they hear no one comes to the Father except through me, they will hear that there has come an answer to their loneliness, their alienation, their isolation, their sinfulness, their guilt, that there is a way. He has come to them and he is willing and ready to receive them. And this is really, really good news. Don't overlook your dry cleaner. Because there are people who are just literally dying to hear. That there is a way, there is truth, there is life. Would you stand?
stand with me all across the room. You know, you can have a, um, you can have informational knowledge about Jesus without personal knowledge. But you cannot have personal knowledge without informational knowledge. If you've got informational knowledge, if you know that God sent his one and only son to die a substitutionary death on the cross, if you know that, if you know that he was raised after three days and he was raised having died so that we might be forgiven of our sin, given the gift of a new life like his, if you know that, you're half the way there. Knowing it is first step, putting your personal trust in this same Jesus is going the rest of the way. That's where the personal knowledge comes from. And I love, here, grab my Bible. I love this picture of Christ on the cross with his arms wide open. Because I see God opening himself to us. I see him saying, though it costs me my life, I want you to come to me. I want you to come to me. I've held nothing back. as we come to the close of this service, I want you to get into your mind and in your heart that this is the posture of the God of the universe toward you. He says, come to me. You may have heard the story a million times, but my question is, has his story become yours? know him informationally, but do you know him? Can you celebrate him personally? He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is my way to the Father, my source of truth, my source of life. Can you, can you say that? If not, today, here, now, the life of Jesus is available to you. But you've got to step out of the information toward the person and say, here I, here I am. I trust you. I want to give my life to you. I want to give you that opportunity today. So I'm going to ask our pastors to come and take their places. Look, 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 look. I'm, I'm, some of you here today really do need to step out of the information into the personal. And I'm praying that that will be today for you. That will be today for you. So here's what I'm asking you to do, wherever you are. Come on, Adam. John, why don't you take a place? Um, wherever you are, just slip out. Just say, excuse me, and people will make a way for Just slip out and come to one of us and say, I'm ready to go from informational to personal today. This is your day. Thanks again for listening. If you'd like to dig deeper into this message, you can access the discussion guide right where you found this message, either on the website or over at the Center Grove app. Also, head to cglife.org to learn more about Center Grove, what we're up to, and how to access even more resources. 
thanks again for opening God's Word with us today. We hope that you've been encouraged and challenged to walk deeper in relationship with Him.